Welcome to Indiana Sports Beat Radio, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Know your role and shut your mouth, you jabroni! Fires upfield into the end zone, and it's caught! Jelani Woods! Touchdown! I-N-D-Y! A 43 point night for Tyrese Halliburton! How do you like that, buddy? Galloway drives all the way to the hole, throws it up, got it! Indiana's got their first lead of this contest. It's pretty simple, I win. Google me. Now, here's your host, Jim Coyle. Hey, hey, everybody, welcome aboard another edition of Indiana Sports Beat Radio. Thanks a lot for joining us here on this day. Looking forward to it. Dylan Sin will be joining us from the Fort Worth, Fort Worth, Fort Wayne Journal and Gazette. As usual, Kyle Nendrip from the Indy Star and the captain, Rick Bozich from WDRB.com. We'll, uh, Get you caught up on what's going on. NCAA tournament, uh, NIT, Indiana, Indiana State moves on. The Sycamores still growing, baby, uh, as they won last night in the uh, in the NIT. I think that was the uh, was that the semifinals, John, or quarterfinals? I think it was the semifinals. No, no, last it, night I believe was the quarterfinals because there's two more sets, of, or I guess one more set of games tonight. There's two of them. And that is between UNLV and Seton Hall and Utah and uh, BCU, I believe. So then we'll find out who all is in the Final Four. But right now, then, uh, Indiana State's in the Final Four then, apparently, right? Correct. That is true. Good for them. Uh, the Sycamores rolling on. And uh, that sure has to be good for their coach. Not good for Indiana State because the more he wins, the more he's probably going to be a wanted man. So he, I can actually, as somebody who's been following the Louisville search, I can give you some some information about some Mr. Josh shirts. He's actually already signed something with St. Louis. And the reason that I even know that is because Louisville had, that they were pursuing him after the Dusty May failure. And the only reason that they're unable to get Josh shirts is because he already signed something with St. Louis. He's allowed to finish what he's doing with Indiana State before he makes the full transition over to St. Louis. And because of the way that Louisville's involved here is because Josh Hurd was unaware until yesterday about the whole situation with him signing a contract. And so if Louisville were to take Josh Schertz out of St. Louis now, he would have to pay the buyout because of the contract that Josh Schertz already signed, which I believe is around $6 million. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. My well, I mean, I hopefully can't blame. all that came across correctly. I know a lot of yes. that some people may not know, but it, I, it is public information. But not everybody's it, keeping up with that kind of stuff right now. But it goes to show you how difficult and how much these things change. Trust me, if the Louisville AD was not aware of something, it was kept pretty hush hush. Yes, um, and yeah, that's so. When when you when you uh yeah, I just want to laugh at that because it Louisville, is Louisville's in a mess right now. And I know at the very end of the show yesterday we talked about Richard Patino being mentioned. He is now one of the two major front runners for the Louisville job, along with Pat Kelsey at Charleston. And I think if if you're choosing between the two, and I heard this from most Louisville fans yesterday, I think you want Richard Patino. He's not, I mean, he's obviously not flashy. Yes, the, the number one thing that you would love about having Richard Pitino is that he is the son of Rick Pitino, your legendary head coach, or former legendary that, head coach. Uh, so. That's pretty wild. And he has yeah. he has a lot to prove still. He's a young guy. I believe he's around 41 years old. If he ends up getting the Louisville job and he's successful, he could be there for 25, 30 years down the line if he's happy there. Well, Let's don't get too far ahead of ourselves, but well, I'm, I'm talking about the it's investment a great... that you would want to make in him, kind of thing. Yeah, but that's if a, he ends up working would, out. It would be a great story, absolutely for Louisville. Uh, it would be a great story in college basketball if you want to be honest with you. Uh, very, very cool. John says he heard that on the Bearcat radio station listening to the game last night. Well, I'm sure that's when it came out and when it when it finally broke, but uh, 
Uh, thanks to everybody that's on the Andy Moore Honda hotline. Don't forget, Indiana Sports Beat Radio, powered by Andy Moore Honda. Just go to andymorehonda.com to get more to your door and the best of new and used vehicles. And free think. Free think apparel and promotions for uh, all your needs, promoting, printing, whether it's 200 T-shirts for your uh, upcoming softball league or 20 for the uh, family reunion. Their team of industry ex experts work with you to design a professional-looking sales-generating web store for your custom-designed apparel. From large corporations and high school sports teams, national accounts, and pro-led athletic camps, Freethink Apparel delivers. Visit freethinkapparel.com today and get printing. That even goes with my shirt today. How about that? Uh, but, yeah, I... Uh, that's it's funny. I'm not laughing at Louisville funny. I am just that the whole story is funny. I, that's a first on me that uh, a guy being sought after it's discovered that he's already signed with somebody else. Not I've to mention, never... <laughs> apparently this morning, Bob Huggins threw his name into the ring as he somebody who would like to be considered. I don't know if that's going to happen, but apparently he has made it public that he wants to be considered for the Louisville job. And I'm sure they will. Uh, Bob, thank you very much for your, your uh, input. We appreciate you. That's going to be a thanks, but a no thanks. That's going to be a, <laughs> a pass. Um, they, Louisville has had enough problems. Uh, and not to job. Or Bob Huggins is not a great, a good coach, but he's old. He's thrown himself he's under the bus baggage. too many times in the past year, honestly. Yeah. his he's. I hate to say this, how it's going to sound, but... Uh, it's a little, you're a little, he's a little old to resurrect his career at a place that is in need of someone like with, with a clean Louis slate, Lewis. if we're being honest. Yeah. Yeah. So looking forward to talking about the transfer portal. Of course, uh, Tony Perkins, Iowa senior point guard from Indiana. Name might be familiar. Went to Lawrence North. He is uh, in the transfer portal. Anybody know a college team that might need, be in need of a serious senior point guard? Or not necessarily a senior point guard, but someone of... I do. I wish I had a buzzer. Had, I'd buzz in. <laughs> John, for 500. What is, or who is Tony Perkins? Or, yes, what is Indiana? Who is Indiana, who, 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 I guess. Who is Indiana? There you go. <laughs> uh, ding, ding. You are correct, sir. Uh, how ironic is it Indiana has to go get a guy via Iowa that's from Indiana? You know why? Because Iowa recognizes the talent in Indiana talent and in Indiana prospects and develops that talent. It's not the first guy to go there. There was a guy named Jack Nungy a few years back. He wasn't great. You don't have to be great. He was pretty good from down in Newburgh, Iowa. Uh, oh, gosh, darn it. There was another guy from down in the southwest part of the state. Now, this has been back in the 2000s, but uh, skipping my name. But it, it's, it's amazing how many players Iowa has gotten from Indiana. But there you go. You see, one uh, other name in the transfer portal is uh, Mr. Jalen Blackman, who we mentioned last week, the Stetson transfer. Imagine that. Know anybody? Do you know any teams that might could use a shooter? Uh, like Jalen Blackman, shooting guard. Another imaginary buzzer. <laughs> John. Who, who, as I saw in the comments, H O O, who is Indiana? That would be correct, sir. You would be correct. That is too straight for you. You were on a you're on a heater. You are on a heater. It's so funny. It it will crack me up. And if Indiana ends up getting some Indiana players all from other schools, because these are guys that were ignored. Now, obviously, Jalen Blackman coming from Stetson was not sought after by other division one teams and that's because and i get and i get this you have to understand 
the transfer portal is now being looked at as the uh, uh, the minor leagues and what happens in the in the minors they develop these players they the the minors are for the guys who are not ready for the big time but they get to play he got to play at stetson he got to learn uh what it's like to be in pressurized situations he 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 was out he learned how to put up 43 points in a game so that one, I'm not going to bang on anybody for not recruiting because uh, it's like Sean East. Everybody keeps saying, you know, well, if you go back and look at Sean East's career, he didn't, it's not like he went to Purdue first and then was bouncing around. No, he had to work his way up from the small school as well. Was too small, too skinny, uh, had to just put a lot of stuff on. So, but now, uh, Jalen. Blackman is looking like uh, another Blackman that could wear the Indiana uniform and his, as his brother James Blackman Jr. did, which would be cool to see that uh, for that family. But, yeah, Tony Perkins, he's on the clock now, man. Um, so we'll see about that. Indiana football is rolling along. And uh, up next, we've got Dylan Sin. We'll talk more about the transfer portal, and everything that's happening this past weekend and coming up in the uh, tournament. We're back with more Indiana Sports Beat Radio, brought to you by Andy Morahada and Freethink Apparel, right after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. In the market. In the market. All right. Good morning, Dylan. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? I'm doing just peachy. All right. Long time no see, Dylan Sin. Yeah, that's right. How are you, Jim? <clears throat> I'm all right, brother. How are you? I'm good. I'm getting ready to uh, go to Detroit on uh, Friday. Detroit, Rock City. <laughs> see, I would play that if we were going to get copyrighted for it. <laughs> you don't know who sings that, do you, Dylan? I don't. What? I, you know, so do you I, not listen to rock music at all? I know. I actually wow. do. I just don't know that one. I'm sorry. Dylan, yes. first of all, ho- first of all, to hear John chiming in that he knows something. Jim, is, you know I like with the music. I can, I, I, I can name you anything. I know. I know. But <laughs> to hear him chiming in that he knows something that happened prior to 2000, the year 2000, <laughs> I'm like, wow, I'm going to step back and just enjoy that one. Almost um, any movie reference is an, a non-starter for me. There you yep, go. he's out. He's out. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so I just got a little enjoyment out of that. Is all. There you go. Kiss, man, Detroit. Yeah, Kiss is never one I really listen to. See, that's the thing. Is well, they finally, uh, they finally retired last year. Did they? All right. But, and so that's the thing is that like when I was a kid, yeah, when I was a kid, um, I listened to a whole bunch of rock with my parents in the car, but neither of them were kiss people. So like, I, I never learned it. So like, I know, I know a ton of Led Zeppelin. I know the Rolling Stones. I know. Oh, so you uh, know the era. You just don't like kiss or not, not that you don't like, but you still I, I, kiss. I, I, have, I have no familiarity with basically any of Kiss's catalog. Well, they weren't being played on radio. Exactly. Yeah. But like, like, but, like no, like. But like my parents had like albums and stuff that we would listen to. Yeah, I mean their I radio era Kiss wasn't was getting radio play. Interesting. Back in the seventies, they were, but I'm talking about during the Dylan Sin era. Sure, of course. How old are you, radio Dylan? list? I I turned thirty in January. Oh, you're not that much older than me. I'm 26. Yeah, I thought you and were in your mid thirties for whatever reason. I don't oh. know. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate that. <laughs> you want to be? Do you want to be seen as older, or do you prefer to think of you as younger? <laughs> uh, younger, if possible. You know, like, a, like. Uh... <laughs> All right. Because I call on you early in the morning. I look tired. I thought you said he's in his mid forties. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Products around and everything you need to make a gourmet meal at home or pick out a tomahawk steak or a grouper filet and enjoy it cooked to perfection in Chop Shop Steakhouse. Chop Shop Market and Table, a part of the Wild Food Group, is your butcher, baker, and fish house, no matter where you live. 
This segment is brought to you by The Chop Shop, home of the Indiana football and men's basketball coaches shows. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back. It is Wednesday. Uh, we're at, we hit the midpoint. Guess what? That means tomorrow, NCAA basketball is back. It, it seems like this is this year. Dylan has been just a nonstop uh, delivery of NCAA basketball, even though we'll have two days between it, uh, between the the women and the men's. It just seems like it has just been nonstop. Uh, you did have the NIT going last night with Indiana State. So, uh, and then there are more games tonight. But finally, this might be the first day where there's no involvement that we're like just staring at uh, from a game standpoint. Uh, but you've got the transfer portal instead to stare at right now. And for Indiana, before you joined us, we talked about a couple of names that have hit that. Uh, Tony Perkins at Iowa, and of course Connor Asijian from Wisconsin is in the portal. I just would find it hilarious for Indiana to end up with some finally some Indiana type guards on their roster, although they had to get them from other teams outside of the state for that to happen. Yeah, yeah, and uh, don't forget you guys talk about Connor Hickman at all. Uh, yeah, guy, kid from Bradley, who is a Bloomington native, who is also in the portal, who is taking an Indiana uh, visit here coming up soon as well. Um, so yeah, you could end up with with two or three guys uh, from the state just just joining the team kind of randomly here in the, through the transfer portal. So yeah, it, it, that's the thing is that what we've seen over the last uh, week and a half or so here since Indiana's season ended is basically. First of all, focus on guards. We knew that was going to be the case, and then basically, Indiana reaching out to essentially the way I the way I can as, as far as I can tell, every guy who shoots better than thirty eight percent from three, you're getting a call from Indiana basketball. <laughs> um, so you know, at least you you can see the vision for what they're trying to do. You can see that they are trying to address the problem that they had last year, which I guess is, is something. Um, I do think that uh, that that yeah. Like you said, Tony Perkins and and Connor Asijian and Connor Hickman. Asijian was interesting to me because basically he, there was a report very late in the season from Wisconsin media that he was staying. That he had basically told the coaching staff, "I'm staying. I'm not going into the portal." And then he went into the portal, um, which um, and I, I, there's obviously no inside information here, but suggests that that there was some reason for him to do that in specific. So I'm wondering if there was a team that kind of lured him out out into the portal. Um, and and obviously part of it too is that Asijin, who is from up up my way here in uh, in he's from Fort Wayne, but he went to Central Noble High School. He um, he started as a freshman at Wisconsin, averaged almost 12 points a game, shot 36 percent from three, and then he lost a lot of playing time. This year, he didn't play very much late in the season. Uh, he wasn't starting. He wasn't projected to start next year, I don't believe, unless something changed. So obviously a part of it could too could be playing time where it's like, hey, I, I was a starter and then I was not. Let's see if I can be a starter again. So, so yeah, I, I'm fascinated to see where his recruitment goes. Uh, but yeah, there like and that's the thing is this is what I said at the end of the seat at the end of the season was. You can build through the transfer portal, like like it, like you don't want to build through the transfer portal. That's not uh, that's not ideal, right? You don't want to have had Liam McNeely decommit, but it is possible to build through the transfer portal. There's hundreds of guys in the portal right now, and you can find your team of five or six or seven who fit what Indiana wants to do. The question is, can you build through the portal and find guys whose personalities match? I think that that's what Indiana is, has to do here over the next couple of weeks is find guys who not only fit what they want to do stylistically in basketball terms, but find guys whose personalities really mesh together. And that's a tough task. It really is. Like, like um, th there are teams who have done it, Nebraska being one of being the most prominent example. But you need to have guys whose personalities fit together because otherwise it's going to make for a long season, even if you're pretty good, which you're not guaranteed to be. So. I'm fascinated to see how they go about doing that. Yeah, it, it will be. Um, 
uh, Indiana fans are certainly waiting to see how they go about doing that. But uh, it's something that will get done. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and this could be interesting because Indiana will still have to replace Kalel Ware. And, but you're adding this to a, a lineup that will have Gabe Cups. He'll be back. Uh, McKenzie Mbako has not announced yet. But I would expect him to come back, especially if they start adding some talent at guard, make him feel better. Um, and uh, Mackenzie Renew, uh, Renew uh, Malik Renew has announced he's coming back. So you've got the core uh, makings there of a solid uh, starting lineup. And then you fill that in with some guys that are either as good or better to have, but good Lord, I hate, I would almost be afraid if, if Indiana actually ended up with, uh, if I were a fan, I'd be afraid if they ended up with multiple guys because then you might end up going back to that dreaded second unit. Second unit. Second Who, unit. Who's excited for a second unit full of transfer guys? We love that. Come on, we? come on. <laughs> you know it. You know you want it. You know you want the second unit back. Uh, hey, hey, look, if, if they can run like three guys off the bench who shoot 40% from three, hey, I'm fine with the second unit stuff. Run them in there. Get get to it. Get, get some guys that get hot. You know, that kind of thing. I think most people would be, unfortunately. <laughs> no one, uh, uh, whoever desired, devised the second unit uh, initially, was not did, did not get memo did not get the memo that you need production uh, from the second unit you can't send in a wave of guys who are not going to score and who are going to allow the other team to score um yeah that's just kind of funny but um uh, Indiana could go it, this could be great for Indiana it it's sad that it will have taken four seasons for this realization to hit. Not that uh, they didn't have talent in the first couple of years, but it's just it's taken this long to for it to, to dry, be driven home that you have to have this kind of talent. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they end up with uh, out of these guys. Tony Perkins is a guy who has great Big Ten experience. That is a huge help. Connor Asijian, another guy with great Big Ten experience. So they played in big games. They know what it's like to have to uh, play in those types of situations. They Hell, they played in Assembly Hall, uh, for that matter. Connor Hickman, uh, pretty much the same way. I mean, not at the same level, but uh, when you're all conference at something, yeah, you've had a pretty damn good year uh, at, at the Division One level. There's been some guys I've seen that they've talked to that I'm like, he shot what, 28% from three? Why are you talking to this guy? Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, but uh, this is a, a way for Indiana to rebuild uh, and move forward with a, with a team to, to quickly get over the hump uh, for this program and to get back into a, an era where they are competitive. And that has to happen quickly. We were also talking about the Louisville situation and how mercy uh, last night, Indiana state wins. They, they now are in the final four for the, for the uh, NIT, but their coach unbeknownst to virtually everyone had already signed a, a contract with St. Louis to move on after the season. Not only did no one know it, Louisville, didn't even know it, and they were trying to get him as a coach. I've no. never heard of that ever happening, that an AD is pursuing someone, and then he finds out they've already signed a contract with another school. No. Yeah, that, that, that that's a wild situation. Louisville's coaching coaching search here has kind of taken a weird turn. They, I mean, they, they, it's, what, three options now that they've genuinely pursued who have either chosen to stay at their original school because they got kind of turned down by Scott Drew, it sounds like, and, or gone somewhere else. You know, you got Dusty May going to Michigan. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, uh, your man going to St. Louis here. And so I, I'm – it's it's an interesting situation. I, I, the report yesterday was that one of their top targets now is Richard Pitino, uh, who was, of course, 
uh, previously the coach at Minnesota, is now the coach at New Mexico. Uh, who, I mean, New Mexico is very good this year, to be clear. So I, he, he can coach. He wasn't a great coach at Minnesota. He was fine. It's just a question of, okay, this is the son of the guy who put you on probation in the first place. What are we doing here, guys? Uh, uh, I don't, I don't like, buy like, that. I like he was like, yeah I, I I know but it just it, it's a very Louisville thing to do and it, it, it's kind of funny at this point because they're they're looking for someone who wants the job anyone wants the job please take the job well you also have Steve Alford who was great at New Mexico and Nevada but yeah. that's where it ends yeah. um you have to wonder we've seen guys that that have good runs at schools like New Mexico and Nevada, these mid-major schools where it's not as tough. Um, I mean, Steve Alford has made a career out of winning. Great guy. Don't get me wrong. But his his tournament record is absolutely awful. Yeah. I mean, as, as bad as anybody in coaching, to be honest with you, uh, over 30 years. I'm bringing that up because you don't know what Richard Pitino would be like at this level. He hasn't proven that he could do it. Now, Minnesota is a tough place to win, period. I get that. Louisville's an easier place to win, and I think it would be an easier time for him. It would be easier to recruit. He would have more resources, and I'm sure that would help him. Um, but he's still it's still a step up, and can he make that move? to where he can successfully coach in the ACC. No, it, it, it's, it's absolutely a question. Um, and, yeah, Minnesota is a tough place to win. We've seen that. But it's, it's not like he was transcending what they usually do. He he, he made a couple of tournaments. Uh, he basically did about as well as Tubby Smith had previously, and which was, which was relatively impressive. There was nothing special there. But he did indeed end up getting let go or kind of pushed out of that job. So, yeah, it, it'll, it'll be really interesting to see. that. That's just one option. There's still good options on the board. There are always good options on the board. It's just a question of whether Louisville thinks that um, it, something is palatable to the fan base, right? Because you have to be able to sell a hire to the fan base. And at this point, whoever they get is probably going to be pretty unpopular considering that they're the fourth or fifth or sixth option, which is interesting at this point, too, because now you're looking at most coaches want to believe that they were the first or second call for a job, Right. And now you can't really sell that if you're Louisville. Now you're saying, well, we're, we're halfway down our list of guys here. How would you feel about coming in for an interview? And uh, I, I, I'm sure coaches are going to are gonna jump at the chance to have a, have a chance to talk to Louisville, but I'm sure some of them are not going to be particularly pleased to be like, oh, well, I was the sixth option? Cool. Um, so I, I'm interested to see how that plays out because, again, it, it's still a great job. It's a fantastic job. Um, you can win there. It's just a question of how do how do the coaches who are in contention feel about the process that's played out so far? Absolutely, and uh, it is going to be something. The tournament has been something already, uh, but it has been most. I don't want to say mostly, but a lot closer to chalk uh, than many of us thought it would be because it hasn't been that way for a minute, and. Uh, I didn't think there would be a lot of change to that this year because of the portal that you just don't know where someone's going to come from. But kind of back that the women's on the other hand is all chalk. Uh, that's not surprising really. Uh, that's kind of how the women's game has been. Although it's getting, it's getting a little closer. You know, I look at the Indiana Oklahoma game, Oklahoma gave Indiana all they wanted and Indiana that was all that they fought uh, um, and, and they fought hard to win that game, but still chalk. Uh, and that, that shows that the best are usually better than um, uh, upsets are a little harder to come by uh, on that side of the bracket. But uh, Indiana moving forward into the sweet 16, unfortunately, their reward is uh, a boxing match with Mike Tyson. Um, that that's that's like winning. Yeah, that's like winning a fight, and your reward is you get to go fight Mike Tyson in his prime. Yeah, not looking forward to that. And by that, I mean South Carolina, and their team is awesome. Um, they're just they're just good. Yeah, it's 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 a very tough matchup for Indiana. I don't think there's really any way. 
any way around that. Of course, if South Carolina wins, there's a chance they play Notre Dame also in the round after that, which is kind of funny. Uh, so they might be able to knock out both teams from the state of Indiana back to back. But no, it reminds me of, I, I guess, if you want to put a positive spin on it, it reminds me of when uh, the, the Indiana men faced Duke in 2002, right? Like this is this is a juggernaut. This is a team no one can beat. You're, you're facing them in the Sweet 16. You have some momentum. Go see if you can pull off a uh, a monumental upset and, and make a huge memory for the program. Like that's that's what you got to be thinking is, hey, we're here. We're Indiana. We we earned the right to be here. We were a number one seed last year and lost. This number one seed can lose. So they got to be thinking this whole week. Yeah, that's a game Indiana had. I think five players fell out. Uh, Teddy Valentine fouled out five Indiana players out in that game. Ironically, I mentioned that because with Houston's win the other day, they became the first team, ironically, since 1987 to yeah. win a tournament game with four starters fouled out of the game. Oh, my gosh. And their fourth, their fifth starter had four fouls. Um, but <laughs> we'll talk more about tournament action and everything else. Dylan Sin from the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette is with us. Back with more Indiana Sports Beat Radio brought to you by Chop Shop Market and Table, where you can find the best in quality meats. You can dine in and get 10% off in the bakery, the the uh the deli, the butcher, all that and more. Back right after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. If you're looking for a home. Oh, anything you got going on? Anything you're hearing? Anything? Um... Yeah, uh, I mean, not not particularly. Like I said, I will be in. Uh, I will be in Detroit on Friday. I'm covering the uh, the CIT championship tonight. I remotely. Uh, Purdue Fort Wayne is in the CIT championship, so that's exciting. Now, uh, is that the CIT that replaced the? Did that replace one, or is that the one that was already in the, effect? That's the fourth level tournament, that, right? That's below the, the CBI. That, yeah, they're 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 kind okay, of okay. The like, CBI is still around. Yeah, the, the CBI is still around. The, the those are kind of three A and three B tournaments. They're they're generally similar level. Um, but yes, the the CIT is the CIT went away for two years. It didn't get. It played needs to go away. Period. Why? It's Why the is there a need for four tournaments though. for teams to get postseason experience? For, for four like have playing in the damn pinstripe bowl. I mean, that's yeah. not the exact comparison, but you know. Well, what let I'm me saying. ask this: How many teams are not playing in a postseason tournament with four total tournaments? Well, there, there's still. Let's see. So there's six sixty-eight. The so the everybody NIT can get a trophy. Is, well, there's. There's like 240 teams that are not playing in the postseason, right? Like PFW, only three teams are playing from their entire conference are playing in the postseason. You have to finish above 500 to get an opportunity. I don't uh, think it, it's about the trophy as it is about getting your players' experience as well. Yeah. I assume. Purdue Fort Wayne has basically everyone on the entire team coming back next year except for one guy. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, they never won a trophy before. Like, well, since they've been to division one, they never won a trophy before. Like that's, that's a really exciting thing for them. Um, they're down there, they're up there at, uh, Norfolk state, uh, in Virginia. Uh, they, they, they flew from Dallas to Norfolk in one day. Um, like they, they, they were like, they played 36 hours later. So yeah, it's a really exciting thing for, for PFW. They're, they're, they're thrilled actually. So these are these are like twenty win teams getting like you, you don't just lose in your conference tournament and like oh the season's over even though we won twenty two games like yeah get to play some more basketball get get some more good teams and see how it goes you know yeah and plus those tournaments they're not really for the power programs they're for the lower level programs uh, yeah for the most part especially since they they made the um like they they went to power programs in the NIT now it's funny because a lot of the power programs the NIT are like declining to be in the NIT now, but they, they yeah. had tried to make the NIT more for the power programs. So, yeah. All right. Let's see how much time we got. All right. 20 seconds. Pilots, HRVs, CRVs, Honda Ridgelines, payment free for 90 days or get 0.9% APR financing for 36 months on a 2023 Honda Ridgeline. Go to anymorehonda.com and get more to your door. This segment is brought to you by Remax Advanced Realty, Indie Home Pros team by Cheryl Sizemore.
Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back in Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Wednesday. Thanks a lot for being with us. Jim Coyle with you as always. Dylan Sin from the Fort Wayne Journal and Gazette. Also, uh, before he heads out to cover the the Boilers this weekend up in Detroit Rock City, brought to you by our good friend Cheryl Sizemore and Remax Realty for those looking for a home in the Indianapolis market. You need Cheryl and her 20 years of experience. Could be the difference between getting the home you want or not. Reach out to her, Cheryl, at IndieHomePros.com. Dylan Sin, um, man, we've got through the first four days of the men's tournament and it was a rock and roll fun as always. Uh, not as many upsets as as usual, but didn't matter. Some of the games that weren't upsets were still incredible games. Houston has to go to uh, an overtime. Somebody played a, a two overtimes. I forget who that was. Uh, one of my picks, uh, I, I do recall. But it, it has been. It has still been fun with even with a few less upsets. Uh, upsets. They, you don't have to upset uh, everybody because the TV networks, while they l- at the time the upsets are great, that's when it loses kind of its luster a little bit because moving forward, they would rather have Duke playing somebody than say Oakland. Um, it, it, that's just uh, the long and the short of it, but. I love, I will never forget Steph Curry Golke. Uh, I will never get that name out of my head, mainly because of that. Did I, I sent that to you. Did you watch that? The, yeah, the, the Calipari, um, how, yeah. how, their, how their defense kind of basically made it easier for him to get his shots off. Yeah, but it was not about that as much. I was just enjoying the, the humor. It yeah, was oh, all about, course. yes. Because ha- I'm going to be honest with you. Half those shots were like, were circus shots. Yeah, well, that's the thing is like is, is they were he's shooting off of one foot. Yeah, yeah. He, he's shooting off of one foot. His body's all over the place. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if that's bad defense or just crazy good shooting there. I'm like, wow. Yeah. But, give, him his, uh, give him his flowers. Like yeah, that's the thing is like you can't attribute it all to Kentucky's defense. He's a good shooter. But yeah, yeah. But I just I just enjoyed the humor of it. Oh, that was course. just and the guy wasn't trying to be funny. I don't think. <laughs> Um, but I, I enjoyed it nonetheless. That was one of the more enjoyable things so far for this, oh, for yeah. this year. Uh, so Purdue now Purdue moves forward. I really pissed the Purdue fans off the other day. And I, I'm, I, that's why I love how I tell Dylan this all the time. I love having him on because he's someone who would generally take the opposite side of, of, of anything I say, because I am, I, I'm not afraid to kind of go out on a limb on things. I said that Zach Eady is not a great basketball player. Great basketball player. And, of course, Purdue fans get all up in a rage about that. Let me clarify. First of all, he's a dominant college basketball player without question. I mean, there's – individually, he he's damn near impossible to stop. I, I, I'll grant that all day, but it's because of his size and his size only. It's not that he's a great basketball player. I, I you know, someone responded, "Well, LeBron James wouldn't be great if he wasn't six eight. And I'm like, "Well, I think of someone like Larry Bird. I'm like, I, I would take a six six Larry Bird. I bet you a dollar against a dozen donuts that he's going to be a badass. Still, he's going to find a way to be a great shooter. He's going to find a way to affect the game." Uh, he can get up and down the floor, and I don't think at the next level that Edie is going to be able to do that because the NBA game is a very, very different game. You have guys that uh, – do they even have – still have the same – I mean, is there, there – there's not even always a dedicated center on the floor, yeah. is there? No. Well, that's the thing is that if you're an NBA team and you have Zach Eady on the court, like there are going to be times where he's going to still be the biggest guy on the court by a wide margin and he might be able to dominate an NBA center. The problem is, is that now you get you put you put a small ball lineup out there 
and you have like a six nine guy playing center, which the which NBA teams do every once in a while, you know, and it becomes tough for him because he, this the thing is he he has gotten significantly better this season. Um, there in in specific ways, including guarding on the perimeter. There are times this year where he has been switched on to a guard on the three point line and has actually done a really good job of staying in front on defense. It's been kind of impressive to watch. I don't know if he'd be able to do that with a small ball center. Uh, in the NBA, it, like it would be, it would be tough for him. And I think that there are ways you can. My the, my my plan and and my feeling about him is that NBA coaches are very smart people. They they are good basketball minds and they know what they're doing. They can find a use for someone who's as big and as strong and as tough as Zach Eadie is because he is all three of those things. He is not just big; he's incredibly strong. A lot of guys who are his height. Are, have these really are, are really like kind of scrawny almost because it's hard to put on weight when you're that big. But he's also very very strong, and so I think the NBA coaches are going to find a use for him. The question is how much use you can get out of him before you end up getting the the other coach counters and you get a mismatch. Now that's still something that that, that is notable. Like he's probably going to make coaches count like basically do counter moves in the NBA, which is not something you can say for a lot of players in the NBA. Right. Oh, so, so, it, so I, I'm fascinated to see, cause I like, I do think NBA coaches will find a use for him. Uh, it's just a question of what that use is and how, how he finds a role in the league. But I do think he'll play in the NBA. Yeah. And I, and I've never said that he wouldn't. I've just said, I don't think he's a great basketball player. And I don't, I think he's a giant, the a, a dominant in college without question. And college is a different deal. Uh, I just, We'll see what he's able to do and and uh, going forward. But right now, Purdue has to worry about playing a team in Gonzaga that is probably in the best position they can be in because they haven't been talked about this year. They have not been a team that's been getting propped up uh, as a team expected to go to the Final Four, as a team expected to win a national title. They've been kind of under the radar. While going to nine straight Sweet 16s, nine straight Sweet 16s, people, think about that. Uh, and they're they're well coached. They know, and most importantly, and I've said this more than once now, I saw um, Mark Few commenting about the year they won or played against Baylor in the national championship game a few years ago, and Mark Few said, "I just wish we would." have been able to play them early in the season and to have a, a better understanding of their physicality. Well, Gonzaga did have an opportunity to play Purdue early this, this season. So they have a, they do have an understanding of what going against Edie is going to be like. So Mark Few is going to have the opportunity to develop a plan. I'm not saying that it's going to work, uh, but he will have the, uh, a better chance of developing a game plan for this game, and I think it's going to be interesting. It damn sure is not going to be the blowouts that we've seen in the first two rounds. No, I, absolutely not. I mean, and, and the first matchup between the teams when they didn't have any chance to prepare for ED was not a blowout either, right? Like it was, they, they played a close game there that they actually led for a good portion of the first half. Uh, the final score, I think, was 73 63. But one thing I've noticed from watching that game back is that. They did a lot of guarding ED one on one, uh, and Graham Ek, their center, whom Indiana fans will remember from the first year Indiana made the tournament under Mike Woodson. They played Wyoming in the first four. That was back when Graham Ek was playing for Wyoming. He's now at Gonzaga. Um, he did a good job of guarding Zach Eady. Uh, just kind of he, he, as much as anyone this year, really defended him just with physicality without fouling. Um, and, and Edie didn't have a Edie still had his points but he didn't have a great game and Purdue had to win that game mostly with guard play, which I think they could do again. Like they, they, they've done a really good job in this tournament of spreading the wealth around. Edie has been fantastic. Obviously there's no way around that, but Purdue has had great performances in this tournament from other players. Fletcher lawyer has been very, very good uh, in this tournament. Trey Kaufman Wren has been very, very good uh, in this tournament. Miles Colvin and Cam Heidi have come off the bench and, and gotten minutes that they weren't getting toward the end of the regular season, which I thought is a really interesting wrinkle from Matt Painter is to get more length and athleticism on the court in these games to just kind of give teams a different look 
that maybe they haven't seen on film. That's another thing where I wonder how they'll they'll adjust to that. If Mark Few will adjust to that now that he's seen that on tape for a couple of games. So yeah, Purdue has done a really good job these first two games of not just uh, of being more than just Zach Eady. Um, and, and so I'm interested to see how that plays out against Gonzaga. I, I do think that Braden Smith is going to have to have a good game. He has not had a particularly good game either of these first two tournament games. He hasn't had to because they've won by so much um, and other guys have stepped up. Um, and he had 10 assists with that with zero turnovers in the, in the opening rounds. So I don't want to say he played poorly, but he hasn't shot very well. And he was such a good shooter during the regular season. That was a huge part of their offense was him hitting pull-up jumpers. I want to see more of that from him in this game against Gonzaga, and they're going to need more of it if Edie is going to be limited somewhat. Yeah, at, uh, and there's going to be a little more pressure being put on the the uh, supporting staff uh, of Zach Eady without question, and, and that's what it's going to take because uh, you're not going to stop Edey. Uh You may slow him down. You may do some things here and there, but you're not going to foul him out, and you're not going to stop him. So that's kind of something that, that I think coaches need or they know that they have to accept and work around, but you're also not going to lose 30 to nothing. Uh, if he has 30, well, you know, whatever, 28 and 80, uh, he's not going to beat you with his points. He, he, that helps having somebody put in that many points, but it's the other guys that has always been the uh, Achilles heel for Purdue with, with the uh, Zach Eady lineup. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, case in point, I'm looking at the box score for the for first Purdue Gonzaga game right now. Braden Smith in that first game in that first game had 13 points on six for eight shooting, six assists, four rebounds, and five steals. Like that, that that's enough to, to basically win a game by yourself, even if you don't get 25 points and 14 rebounds from Zach Eady like you had in that game. So yeah, it, it's going to be the supporting cast for Purdue that, that has to step up, and they and they have. Like I said, in this tournament, they've been very, very good. Trey Kaufman run was outstanding against Utah State. I wrote a story about it today. He had 18 points, eight rebounds, three assists, two blocks. Just he was he was as physical in the in the paint as Zach Eady was, and and it made it so that Utah State could not guard Eady one on one the way or, uh, they could not double Eady the way they wanted to or the way they had planned to because Trey Kaufman and Ren was just picking them apart um, on the other end. So I'm fascinated to see which Purdue players step up because that's the thing is Purdue does have a genuine 10 deep rotation at this point. And that's not something you normally see in the NCAA tournament. It, it usually you shorten your rotation a little bit at, um, at this time of the season. Purdue has actually kind of expanded it in the NCAA tournament by giving Miles Colvin some minutes that he wasn't getting during the uh, during the regular season and kind of kind of pushing Ethan Morton down to more of a, a, a deep deep bench role. But I think Ethan Morton could come in the game and play if they need him to. So I, I'm really interested to see how this goes. I think it's going to be a great game. This is the type of game you, to your point, you'd rather have this type of game in the Sweet 16. I, like you, you, the upsets earlier, great. But this is the type of game you want in the Sweet 16. It's two really good teams slugging it out, and and that's what we've got for a lot of these games here. Uh, there are there, all of the chalk has created some really good Sweet 16 matchups. Uh, Philip pointing out AJ Store has entered the draft. That's a little surprising after the year he had at Wisconsin, coming in from St. John's. Uh, and I, I've got to be honest though, I I, I hate this. The guy goes from St. John's to Wisconsin to wherever. It's ridiculous. I think it's utterly ridiculous. Doesn't matter what I think, but I hate it. No, I I, I don't. I totally understand. And to be clear, he's entered the draft. Like he could come back, right? Like this is, and that's the other part of this is there's so much uncertainty because when you enter the draft, wait a minute, he's entered the draft, not the portal. Oh, that's right. Draft, he's entered yeah. the draft. My, I misread that. My fault. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now he could he could come back and enter the portal. There's there's always that option too. Uh, but it, it, the the thing with the draft is that you you never know whether you're entering the draft. I mean, Khalil Ware seems like he is entering the draft. He is not coming back. Uh, that that they made that pretty clear yesterday. Um, he, and he, to be clear, he shouldn't. He is going in the first round. AJ Store is going is entering the draft in order to probably get some feedback to see where he would go. And so this is what we saw a couple of years ago with Trace Jackson Davis, where it was like. Okay, you're waiting until May to figure out whether you have some of these guys. Now, I'm sure he's giving 
the team an indication as he goes of what his feelings are, but it, it makes roster building more difficult because you're not sure whether you're going to have some of these guys. Um, and, and so I, I am not a boy coaches are so put upon type guy because they're getting paid millions of dollars to figure it out. But roster building is really tough right now. There are a number of different factors that make roster building extremely tough. Um, and, and with the portal, with uh, NIL, with the draft and guys coming back and leaving, it, it's, it's tough. And so I don't envy these guys right now, even though they do, they are getting paid millions of dollars to figure it out. So I don't pity them either. Um, any chance that Zach Eady returns if Purdue loses? No, he has already said that this is it for him. Matt Painter has said this is it for him. And they are um, they are uh, bringing in six freshmen in their recruiting class next year. So not just Zach Eady, but a couple other guys who have eligibility left are going to have to be kind of cleared out, it seems like. Um, Eady is gone. It seems like Mason Gillis and Ethan Morton are gone. Uh, they, they both are seniors who have a COVID year left. Um, but they are basically pretty was acted like they're leaving at the end of the season. So yeah, they're bringing in a huge freshman class and the plan is to kind of reload that way. Um, it, uh, once again, Purdue is not doing anything through the portal. Basically it sounds like unless, unless they have some kind of, um, exodus at the bottom of their bench, they need to fill some roster spots, but, but no, like that's, this is it for Zach Eady. This is, and, and he's made that clear. He said that basically my, what's missing for me is a deep run in the tournament. He said after the, the game against Utah State, he didn't come back to go to the Sweet 16. That wasn't the point of coming back. The point of coming back was to make a deep run. And that's that's his legacy. And I wrote this on Sunday. His legacy at Purdue is on the line here in a real way in the next couple of weeks. And every game now that he that they advance further is another is another notch that he is putting on onto a resume that is one of the best in Purdue history. If they make the final four, there is a genuine argument that could be made that Zach Eady is the best player in Purdue history, which is a, which is an incredible thing to say, but if they make the final four, I think there's an argument for it. Um, what happens to Purdue next year, man? After all this. Oh they... boy. You, Indiana fans are not going to like to hear this. They're going to be good They're I'm telling you, I am telling, they're going to play an entirely different style of basketball, but they are going to be good. I am telling well, you right now. <laughs> well, we'll see. It should be exciting and entertaining. Yeah. What is up next for you? Are you heading to Detroit uh, to cover the, the Boilers? I am. That is right. I will be in Detroit on Friday, and then we'll see what happens after that. If they win on Friday, obviously I'll be there on Sunday. If they lose on Friday, maybe I'll catch a flight out to Albany and see what happens with Notre Dame So or Indiana if they upset South Carolina on Friday. So, so we have a couple options. Look forward to it. Dylan Sin from the Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette. Make sure you're giving him a follow and catching him here uh, each Wednesday. Have fun. Safe travels, my friend. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I will be uh, back on next week to tell you all about how it went. I can't wait. Appreciate you. Dylan Sin brought to you by Remax Realty and Cheryl Sizemore. For everyone looking for a home in the Indianapolis area, you need Cheryl and her two decades of experience. Reach out to her. Cheryl at IndyHomePros.com. We're back with more, including the captain joins us in the next hour. Rick Bozic, back after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. In the market. Oh, I haven't mentioned yet that uh, someone who will not be hitting the portal, John Calipari. John, or John oh, yeah, well, we didn't talk about that. Yeah, he's he'll Sorry. be back. Well, we got the captain. <laughs> he, he can give you probably more on the Louisville search, too. Oh, don't worry. Yeah, we'll talk about it all. He's the one who I saw the Bob Huggins thing from <laughs> this morning. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Ned and Rip. Morning. Hello, sir. How are you guys? Oh, you know. Doing good. Cannot complain. <clears throat> I knew you didn't want to listen to it. Oh, that's a new one I just came up with. I'm going to have to keep that one. <laughs> oh, brother. It's uh, a hell. I, you were covering. They had you cover an NCAA tournament. I didn't get to talk to you. You were already by me. It took about. Five seconds to, for it to register. Oh, the shit, that's Kyle. <laughs> uh, wasn't used to seeing you there. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, 
Let's see, where am I looking for? Are all games played on this Saturday? Yeah. Okay. So I thought. <clears throat> I will be there. Man, that's a long ass day for you to surely they have somebody helping you cover those games. Yeah, we'll have someone there. I think I'm doing two two of I mean, I'll be there the whole time, but we'll have someone covering two of the games. I'll cover the probably two A and four A. Man, I added Nord VPN and it seems to slow everything down. I'll have to start stopping it every time <laughs> I do something. All right, got about 30 seconds. I'll go ahead and pull us back in. These needs, so there couldn't be a better time to build a new home with Property Shore Construction. Now building exclusively south of Bloomington within the Stonecrest Golf Community. Choose from one of the gorgeous Stonecrest Signature Series house plans. We have several lots available with scenic views of the golf course. Contact Amy Rhoda with Revesco Real Estate for additional information. 812-583-0919 or go to mystonecrestliving.com. That's mystonecrestliving.com for more details. This segment is brought to you by Reynolds Family Dentistry in Sellersburg. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Wednesday, and tons and tons of basketball yet to be dished out, including the state championship games all happening this Saturday at Gamebridge Fieldhouse in Indianapolis. Cal Nednarip, the king of high school coverage, is here. Uh, a busy day to be had by you for certain, but uh, it's going to be a busy day at Gamebridge. Man, uh, it's going to be a lot of people to get in and out, first of all, so I feel sorry for the uh, ushers that we will, will be working there that day. Uh, Flory Badunga, named Gatorade Player of the Year. Will he win Mr. Basketball? Uh, probably most likely, but no one knows better than that than Kyle. Kyle, what, it, what say ye? I mean, I think he's probably the, you know, probably the 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 front runner. I, you know, I will say, I think uh, Jack Benner is going to get quite a bit of support, and he's the one – you know, he's still playing. So, you know, Flory's not. Obviously, they got beat by Fishers in the uh, regional round at Newcastle. And uh, and Benner will play in the 2A state championship on Saturday against Wapahani. So, you know, I, I, I do think the way, you know, these votes go sometimes, I think Benner will get a lot of support from from his part of the state, from, uh, you know, probably from a lot of the schools that that play against him and, and probably a lot of 2A uh, uh uh, coaches and and media who cover that class a lot. So I, I, I do think he'll get quite a bit of support. And, you know, you go and play a big game on Saturday and, and play well and win a state title. I think that could help him. But I think with everything what Flory's do done, <clears throat> you know, making state last year, you know, winning as much as he did, um, you know, putting up the numbers he did over his career. Uh, he didn't score as many points as, as Benner, but you know, about every other area, he was really dominant. Uh, and he did score a lot too. He just didn't have as much as Benner, but you know, so I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's any one. Yeah. I kind of like the, the way the ballot just says like, you know, I forget exactly. It just basically just ask who you pick for Mr. Basketball. There's no, there's no uh, stipulation on what you're, what you're choosing. Exactly. You just kind of pick what matters to you. And uh, you know, so I, I think he'll get a lot of support. I, you know, but uh Flory probably had a head start going into the season, you know, and, and I think he definitely didn't do anything this year to hurt himself. And, and, you know, winning, I did a story last week on, uh, you know, what winning uh, Gatorade and, 
you know, winning uh, Mr. Basketball, is there some correlate? You know, it's, there's definitely a lot of crossover there. Uh, you know, it doesn't correlate, you know, to anything necessarily. You know, it's a different voting mechanism and system and whatever. But, you know, you do see that happen a lot of times where, where players double up winning that in Mr. Basketball. And you also see, uh, I can't remember who did it last, but you will also find juniors sometimes that w can win them. They're allowed or they're uh, eligible to win the Gatorade Player of the Year. So you you, you can some junior win that title in front of a potential Mr. Basketball in his state. I don't recall the last time that happened. I know you would know that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, I think, five times – Players have won back-to-back -back, uh, Gatorade Players of the Year. And, you know, most of the time, if you win as a junior, you win as a senior. It's not every time, though. Trey Kaufman, uh, Wren, won as a junior and then uh, didn't win as a senior. And uh, Caleb First actually won Mr. Basketball. So, you know, not every time that that happens. But, yeah, I mean, most of the time, you know, you win as a junior. Normally, if you stay around, you're going to win as a senior. And uh, that's what happened in this case, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, again, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't always, you know, it's just different voting. I, and I, I think Mr. Basketball, it's a, it's a good vote. I mean, you, you, I, you, they get a lot of votes back, which is good. I, I did note it did seem like the, uh, the system changed a little bit this year, which I don't know if that's good or bad, but, uh, just from looking at the website, it looked like it was a little bit maybe harder to find it or whatever, but, uh, so I, I just, you know, you want to make it as easy as possible for people to vote. And uh, hopefully that continues to be the case. But, uh, yeah, I think I think Flory's probably the pick. I don't, you know, again, Benner, I think we'll get support, whether that's enough or he does enough this weekend. You know, I guess we'll find out. Uh, and uh, a, p a recent piece of yours, I, I'm going to actually use the question that you said is a question that gets asked often. How does... Fishers, after losing one of the top players in the country to a prep school, Lalamere, improve enough to become and stay the top-ranked team in the state all year? And that's a great question because that's hard to do, especially when you lose someone as good as Jalen Harrelson. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense because, obviously, Harrelson, uh, you know, very unselfish player you know he, he's, he had the ball in his hands a lot but he also was you know a really good passer you know as a he's a you know almost a better passer probably than a shooter uh to some extent uh but you know he played a good team so so the biggest thing to me is not necessarily anything Jalen did or didn't do but uh just that the other players who came back have just gotten a lot better you know Keenan Garner who is now a division one prospect you know he was he came over from Germany. He was on a living on a uh, military base with his family. His dad got a job, you know, never even really knew much about Indiana, came here and became a really good player uh, for uh, for Fishers the, last year, even too. And then this year he's taken a, a big step. And I he'll he, to me, I am almost positive will be an Indian all star. Uh, but then you've had other players kind of, you know, just get better uh, player development, I think is a big thing with them. And you know, I think that's probably the number one reason you could look at. The second thing is that, you know, they've had two freshmen come in who are, have been better, I think, than even people realize they would be. You know, we didn't know how, you know, Cooper Zachary and, and uh, Jason Gardner uh, would do as freshmen. You know, knew they were good players, but would they be ready for that type of, you know, type of jump into varsity basketball? And both of them have been really consistently good all year. And I, I think the one advantage Fishers has over almost anyone else that they've played this year is that, you know, they put five guys on the floor who can all score in different ways. Uh, not not every team has that. You know, not every team, you know, normally you can look at a high school team and say, you know, stop this guy, you know, the, there's number one, number two, number three, and then maybe the four and five guys you're kind of leaving open or not worried about them so much on offense. Fishers, you can't do that. And, and that's been – you know, they've, they've had games where, you know, like Keenan Garner may not have a great shooting game or may not score much. Uh, you know, Cooper Zachary, the freshman, may not have a great shooting game, but they can go to other people uh, who kind of, you know, every game but one, you know, the Carmel game during the season, they've been able to figure it out and, uh, and, and find a way to win. And I thought it was pretty indicative in the the Noblesville game where, you know, it ends up the ball's in Jason Gardner's hands and he passes it to Parker Purdue who makes the game winning shot. Well, 
Parker Purdue is ninth on the team in scoring and scored four points that game, but he makes the game winning shot. And that's kind of the, the nature of their team. It's just, there's, there's, you know, 10 guys, 10, 11 guys who can, who can kind of all do their job. They can all score in different ways. And, and that's, what's made them so good. They're just, they're just very balanced, you know, and I think that's kind of, there might be teams that have better star players, but but not many teams that can go this deep and ha- and be able to score in so many different ways. And we're going to have a game in which two teams have already played uh, a 13-point win by Fishers, but that was a long time ago at the start of the season. Uh, both teams have, are, are much better now, as usually all teams are, but I think this would probably is expected to be a much closer game than that early season one. Well, and you almost throw it out the window completely because Mark Zachary didn't even play in that game. You know, Mark Zachary was getting ready to play in this, the football state championship that week. So, you know, their best player or second best player, depending on, you know, KJ Wyndham, you know, one, a one B, but Mark, you know, obviously he's their point guard. He makes him go, he was getting ready to play state football that weekend and he was at the game and he was trying to help in the huddles and whatnot, but he, uh, he didn't play. <laughs> so it's almost like, uh, you know, it's not a non-entity completely. I mean, they went, I know Fishers went back and Ben Davis went back and looked at that game and, you know, just what can you glean from, uh, you know, from playing each other that, that early, but yeah, I mean, it's almost, it's almost a nothing because of that reason, um, you know, and Mark is, is, you know, he, he was in kind of football shape to start the season. He's gotten a lot better and, and played phenomenal in the, in the, uh, semi-state, uh, wins for Ben Davis. He's become that, that lead point guard that they really needed this year. So, uh, but yeah, it's just, and, and Ben Davis is not, you know, they're not the Ben Davis of last year as far as talent and depth and height and everything, but they do have that championship pedigree that, that, uh, defending champ sort of, you know, uh, thing to them when it's hard to it's hard to quantify exactly what that is but they definitely have it and I think that carried them through in the semi-state against a very good Jeffersonville team that that gave them everything possible then in Jeffersonville could easily be playing this weekend that that's a really really good team that was playing phenomenal at the end of the season beat a really good Lawrence North team came back and then uh, nearly took out Ben Davis if not for a late comeback there so you know, they're tested, you know, they're, they're definitely tested and they haven't always been great this year. And then they, they, but they second half of the season, they've played much better. So very good team. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I think Fishers is the favorite, but uh, you know, I think it'll be a really good game. I think it will be a lot of fun. Ben Davis likes this type of uh, big game uh, atmosphere. And I think they're going to play well Saturday night. Yeah, and we could be talking about Jeffersonville this time next year because they've got most of the core of their team back. Uh, so look forward to that. Three um, A game. What are your expectations for that? Well, yeah, it, it's it. I think it'll be you know Scottsburg is probably wanting to play a little bit more um, zone. You play a little bit more of a slower style, I would say, than <clears throat> than South Bend St. Joe. Um, you know, Chase Kinesi is, is the star player for South Bend St. Joe. If you remember, his brother, Jr. played there a few years ago. Is now at Notre Dame, was an Indian All-Star. I think that was 2021. Uh, but Chase is a junior, uh, really good player. I'm looking forward to seeing him play in person on Saturday night. And then, uh, you know, and they're they're more of an athletic, you know, team that wants to get up and down. Uh, you know, Scottsburg, I think, can do that too, but – uh, they're they're going to play probably more one three one and and uh, you know use their length. Their long team, you know, Wyatt Zellers, uh, he's a, a nephew and and a uh, a son of the West the Westmorelands who the girls who played. If you remember the Scottsburg, the nineteen eighty nine girls uh, state championship team from Scottsburg, they, he was a uh, you know, basically a, a, a son of the of one of the. Uh, Carla, who played on that team, and then Renee, who was Miss Basketball that year. So it's kind of a cool lineage with uh, that Scottsburg team. But, you know, Cody Clancy, really good player for them, a senior, Jack Miller. Um, you know, so they have different guys who can score for them and, and you know, multiple 1,000-point uh, scores on that team. So kind of a unique team that way. And also the crowd will be interesting. I think Scottsburg is going to bring a ton of people, I, I would assume, that they really support their basketball 
Uh, so you wonder how that kind of plays into it too. And, and you also wonder a little bit about this two week break, how that, how that uh, it's just such a long time to be off, you know? And I thought, you know, a couple of years ago, I guess that was a 21 season. It was, uh, you know, I thought the games were a little bit ragged because I, they did have the extra week that year, yet that year because the NCAA came because of COVID all the tournament was here. And uh, I, I just thought it was kind of a, a little bit rough. Uh, so hopefully that's not the case, but that was also a year where, you know, the, the fans were a little limited. And so it just, I think it felt like a bigger arena uh, than, than uh, it, it'll feel Saturday. I think back to some normalcy will help and, you know, uh, rather than it was in 2021. So I think it'll be, yeah, Scottsburg, St. Joe, I think that'll be a good game. I think, you know, both those night games will be good. The two A game too should be excellent with, uh, Brownstown Central and Wapahani, which both those communities really support their programs. Uh, quickly, the last thing, switching gears a little bit. Uh, Tony Perkins, Connor Asijian, and Connor Hickman, all in the transfer portal, all probably going to be getting attention from Indiana um, after leaving and not playing uh, in, in the state of Indiana, which is a little ironic, but uh, that could, that could change. Yeah, I would say you know, I, I texted with uh, Tony's uncle the, last night, and he said like 30 schools had reached out. It's kind of too early to know, you know, where where he'll end up going exactly. But yeah, Tony will certainly have tons of options. Um, you know, I, I thought uh, Connor Hickman would would could end up going to IU, uh, coming out off out of Bradley, and you know, obviously had a great uh, career there at Bradley and you know, shoots it well. He's, he's athletic kid, you know, always was, you can go back to high school. Um, you know, maybe they should have gave him a longer look even coming out of high school, but, uh, but yeah, I think he's a guy that, man, you look at that. I think that's almost, if they have a spot for him, that would be a, be a really good uh, situation. And then, uh, you know, Connor siege, and I don't, I don't know quite for sure what, what he's going to end up doing. Obviously it's kind of a weird year for him with, uh, with what ended up happening, you just didn't play that much. Uh, yeah, after, his playing time went way down. Yeah, way down, and and uh, so I don't know exactly what's going on there, but uh, obviously he had a really good uh, freshman year, and and certainly proved himself in high school as a, as an excellent player. So I'm sure he'll have a lot of options as well. But uh, but yeah, I'd keep definitely keep an eye on on Hickman, and then probably depends on Tony what his uh, what all his options are exactly. Um, he's, he's a proven commodity though. And, and he's obviously done it in the big 10 already too. So, uh, he would fit, uh, a lot of places. <laughs> so I think pretty much anywhere he wants to go, uh, he's going to have some good possibilities there. Absolutely. Make sure you're giving Kyle a follow and keeping up with all things that are going on this weekend. The state championships wrap up in the state of Indiana at Gainbridge Fieldhouse. Uh, I'll be there as well. So looking forward to that. Kyle, thank you, sir. Appreciate you greatly. You bet. Thanks, Jim. Absolutely. Up next, the captain, Rick Bozich from WDRB.com joins us. Brought to you by our friends at Reynolds Family Dentistry down in Sellersburg. Keep that championship smile. Go see Dr. J. Back with more right after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, oh, presented by da, Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Formerly da, 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 da. Got Kyle Macy on Friday, Richard. Do you really? Cool. Yes, sir. How, uh, how, how did that happen? Or yeah, how what's, does... the, what's the connection just for the state finals or what? No. Um, he did a game. Uh, he works for Westwood One. Oh, uh, okay. And he did an Indiana game uh, not terribly long ago. And because I think, you know, I was there for the coaches show and uh, I think someone had said something. Maybe it was Don. And I'm like, oh, are, are you, you got a kid? I'm sure he's kidding. And I kind of look and I'm like, well, there's somebody sitting there. And he's completely bald now. So yeah. all those guys are hard to recognize when you don't see them for a picture of them even for so long. And then all of a sudden you see him bald. You're like, ah, yeah. And then so I just went up and started talking to him and super nice guy. And so that's it. Um, boy, uh, how about that Louisville program? <laughs> Bob Huggins well, wants the job now. Uh, John passed along the information that you had passed along 
But I'm laughing about um, – oh, daggone it, Kyle. Just, the Josh uh, Shirts we, thing that happened? Yes, yes. What's the latest? Well, well, the, the fact the, that – stuff that came out yesterday about the, uh, the how he signed something and – was already going to St. Louis, and if Louisville really won him, they have to pay his buyout at St. Louis at that point. But actually, the funny the thing that Louisville didn't know that. Yeah, there no one knew that. <clears throat> I don't know. It's been two weeks now, so. What's why? What, wouldn't it be interesting if they get to April first? And not that they would have ever done this, but like <laughs> Kenny Payne's buyout would have been way less if they if they waited for April. <laughs> it's a. Any AD that might be in a position to make a coaching change next year, I'm not going to name any names, needs to watch this and figure out that they need to have their uh, ducks in a row formation in order before they start doing things. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Am I right? I I, I, is that a? Well, I'll say that, but I was going to say is a bad look for. It's not him. a good look. Yeah. And he didn't hire a search firm either, which is kind of well, it makes it fall on him even more so. Correct. That thing is why I always say, why are people in charge yeah. Here, we're, of we're searching? Back. Sorry. <laughs> 0.9% APR financing for 36 months on a 2023 Honda Ridgeline. Go to anymorehonda.com and get more to your door. This segment is brought to you by Bubba's 33 in Clarksville and Evansville. Pizza, burgers, beer. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Hey, welcome back. It is Hump Day here on this Wednesday. And the captain, Rick Bozitz from WDRB.com TV, joins us now. And all kinds of things going on, of course. We've been talking about the tournament. Starts back up tomorrow. The NCAA, that is. The uh, NIT has continued to roll. The trees, uh, Sycamores, Indiana State, and the Final Four of the NIT. Um, Indiana women are in the Sweet 16 of the women's tournament. Purdue in the Sweet 16 of the men's tournament. All kinds of things going on. Louisville, uh in the sweet 16 of trying to find a coach, maybe uh, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, in the break, I was asking Rick, how bad of a look is it for your AD to be looking at a guy who has already signed a contract with someone. And then prior to that, the stuff that kind of went on with dusty may where it looked like they had him had that deal done and not done. Um, so now they're swinging and whiffing. Yeah, I mean it's two. It's been two weeks today since Kenny Payne was fired. Um, number of other jobs have already been filled, um, and as you mentioned, it started out with Scott Drew, went to Dusty May, who I'm fairly confident saying that they thought they had, and he changed his mind at the last minute, went to Michigan, and then on to Josh Shirts, and now it seems to be Richard Patino and um, Pat Kelsey of Charleston, and you could have hired either one of those guys much earlier than this because they've both been out of the NCAA tournament since late last week. Um, you know, in the end, I think this that kind of stuff gets forgotten as long as you get the right guy. I mean, there's an initial PR hit that people always talk about, but there've been other coaches who've been hired who were the third, fourth or fifth choice and did all right. You just have to, you just have to get the right guy and you have to get a guy who can engage with the fan base here because one thing I've talked about here um, with people as opposed to the situations that's happened at IU, when IU's gone through some of these coaching changes, at least the fans were still coming to the games. At Louisville, the fan, the attendance dropped off the cliff. I mean, they, the last few games of the year, they had fewer than 5,000 people in the building. Uh, so you not only have to get players and fix the basketball, you have to get fans back on board. And that's, it can be done, but it doesn't happen like snapping your fingers. It, it takes time to get people to spend their money, to get optimistic again and figure like, this is something I want to do. I agree. Uh, but, and I have three words that I always say that will takes care of both of those winning cures, everything it does. Uh, and, it does. but as you said, but 
it takes a, it takes a little bit of winning for people to really believe that it's real. Just like that'll be the case with Indiana football and and Kirk Signetti. Uh, he's going to have to win win for that to, to turn yeah. that around. Uh, and we'll see about that one. He's in the honeymoon uh, period now, but I got to give him. I, I want to say one thing, and I tweeted it out yesterday. I got to give him credit. He showed up for that women's game on uh, Monday night and sat there, you know, with uh, right near Dolson, I think it was, right? Yep, and, right behind uh, him. Then, then he talked about it yesterday in his press conference, and he talked about it like what he liked about the way they played and talked about how they fell mm -hmm. behind by seven points, like he was really invested in it. Uh, that's a really good look for him that shows that he gets the, the, the whole concept that it's just not about football. It's about the entire athletic department, and you give credit to your peers when they do well. I think the same thing. I had sent out a, a tweet that night of the game. Uh, I tried to get a picture, but I was he was across the court and too far away. But he he looked invested uh, mm -hmm. in the game. Even from his body language gave you that, and it was a hell of a game to be at. Yeah, you, you missed a good one to be at. It was. Right. I sent out a, another tweet that of all the games I've seen in Assembly Hall this I past year. It was without question the most intense, and it was. It was that, and uh, in the media, I, I don't get into games. That one was almost hard not to. It was just, wow. It was a, a title fight, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, back and forth, and it was actually really fun because Oklahoma did not give up. They didn't quit fighting. Indiana didn't quit fighting, and it was an intense game. There was no walking the ball up the floor. They were getting after it. Uh, man, great program. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a moment I think people that, that follow IU Sports will remember for a long time because of the – first, the context of what the women's pro program used to be and what it is now. Um, you know, they were IU football not that long ago where they weren't, they weren't winning that much and people didn't really weren't that invested in it. And Terry Morin's changed that. And now they've been what the four, three of the last four sweet 16s and Mackenzie Holmes is if they ever retire, I don't know if they retire numbers or not at IU, do they? I don't think they do, but no, um, just you go yeah. to the athletics hall of fame, but uh, no, no, so, I mean, she's the face of the IU women's basketball program and the organic moment at the end of the game where instead of there was, instead of a court storm, the players stormed, the crowd and went up in, in, in the bleachers in the end zone. And you can, the pictures that came out of that of just the genuine awesome. joy of how much they appreciated what they did, but how much they appreciate that people pay attention to it. And, and they appreciate the fans coming to see is something you don't see that much in college sports anymore. There's so much that people, they just expect things. And I, you know, I, I might've gone too far, but I contrasted it on Saturday with, you know, this isn't. This is the team that chills out the other opponents, not the team that tells the fans to chill. Uh, and, and I contrasted the way they played with with what Anthony Leal said to the crowd. And um, there's just a different. There's not a sense of entitlement from the IU women's basketball players that they deserve uh, attention. They deserve uh, whatever they get. They they've earned it, and and they want to share it with the fans. And I thought it was a. I thought it was a really genuine moment. Yeah, um, a tweet I'll send out later, but something else that I really thought is they have one person on their roster, the late, the women's team, from the state of Indiana, and that's a transfer in Sydney Parish. She's the only player from the state of Indiana. Um, but the women's team seems to play more for their school than – any program it's like they are invested in yep. the program they're invested yes, they in indiana university not just passing through or whatever the case is and it's palpable yeah i agree i agree 100 percent. And, and really i mean there i think that's reflective of a, a, at a time that a, there are probably a lot of indiana high school kids that didn't want to come to IU. they went elsewhere i mean sydney parish was a mcdonald's all-american she went to Oregon. Allie Patberg was a McDonald's All American. She went to Notre Dame. Yep. Uh, Indiana wasn't the cool place to go. And Terry Morin is particular in, the, in who she she recruits players that want to be coached and want to be coached in a certain way and want to play a certain way. And she's been very good at, at, at doing that. So, um, yeah, it's a great case study in how to build a program and how to build a relationship with your fan base. And I hope more people at IU are paying attention, not to mention any names. 
Absolutely. Uh, and speaking of that, I, I think you heard me talking to uh, uh, Kyle. There are several guys in the transfer portal now that originally were are from the state of Indiana. Tony Perkins right. played at Lawrence North. Connor Asijan from up Fort Wayne. Connor Hickman uh, from Bloomington South right here. Uh, it, it, amazing. It would be amazing if they end up getting one, two, three of these guys that are from the state and there's others. Hell, you got Blackman, which I don't know how serious that is, but um, that they get guys that they, that weren't looked at at first. Now, most of these guys like uh, Tony Perkins, that's on Archie. Uh, so it's not, everything is not, uh, I'm not throwing it on this staff right. per se, but uh, it just shows how it's been and how it has continued to be. But those players are there. Uh, they're available and not being taken advantage of sometimes. Yeah, and, you know, the contrast becomes even more powerful when you look at Purdue and you look at their roster. I think I heard Kyle say last week is that their roster looks like uh, the Indiana All-Star team. I mean, you got um, Braden Smith, you got Fletcher Lawyer, you got Trace uh, Kaufman, Trey Kaufman Wren, you got first you got um what's his name colvin you i mean i'm forgetting a couple of them help mcgillis i mean oh, they got well, a lot of, you got a lot of, yeah. of their roster yeah yeah and they come in Brady there and, smith fletcher lawyer all right. those guys yeah and they're willing to be developed they're not in a hurry to get out of there and they're going to stay and they've won in the big 10 consistently now they they still have to you know get to the final four this year to sort of, I, I think, reach their, what their minimum goal should be for the season, considering how good they've been. But um, there's a lesson to be learned there. And it's, uh, I, I don't know if Mike Woodson is going to follow that blueprint at all. I think he's going to have a hard time doing that because Matt Painter has already sold his vision of, of using Indiana kids to be successful. And it, it's proven and that's going to be hard to overcome. But I, I think that, Purdue, in many ways, has become what Bob Knight used to do is re recruit those kinds of guys and win with them. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, Bob Knight uh, reached the pinnacle three times. That's something that Matt Painter has not been able to right. get to. And this is kind of a uh, – Dylan Sid was on earlier and said that they'll still be good next year, even without Edie, which uh, – that they'll play a different style. Uh, we'll see how that goes then, but – uh, this is a big, big move for Purdue this year. The, it's kind of, man, if, if they don't get it now, whoo, the pressure only built. Does the pressure just continue to build on Matt Painter, even though he does such a, a great job winning, but not winning the Big Apple? Yeah, I mean, I think to, to get rid of the majority of the pressure, he's at least got to get to the Final Four. I mean, he's a one seed. Uh, he's got the national player of the year. He's got a veteran team that's coming back from disappointment last year. If they would get beat by Gonzaga, a team they've already beaten once, or in the, the second game they play, I'm trying to think, it's either Marquette or Tennessee. Is that right? And haven't they beaten both those teams? Yep. Yeah, all the teams up there they've already beaten. Um, so, yeah, if they wouldn't get to the Final Four, I think you'd have to file it under a, a disappointment. Now, you Less of a disappointment if it's the Elite Eight, but it's still a disappointment. Final Four is the minimum I think Purdue needs to do this year to sort of reach some of their goals. I, I, it's unfair to say national championship because that's so hard to do. It, it is. and uh, But when you haven't done that um, and, and you haven't reached that, and, and this is – I'm not going to say it's Purdue's best team ever because that's 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 hard to say. Yeah, you I don't have think it good is. Ones with Big Dog and all those guys, and it and the best team does not always win the national championship. Uh, nope. you've got to have a little luck. Uh, things have, have to go your way. Of, yeah, yeah, you got to have luck in terms of teams that are knocked out, maybe sometimes in your path, and make it easier for you. Or this year, the tournament's been pretty formful. So anybody that makes it to the Final Four this year will have earned it. Absolutely, and. You've got a UConn team that is very – it's its its very strange to have a team that won it last year but lost 75% of their offense in three starters but yet has come back and reloaded to be just as strong, if not stronger. Yeah. I and mean, you got to give credit to Danny Hurley. That's one reason I voted for him for Coach of the Year. I mean, it, just because he won it last year, 
he might have done a better job this year. Uh, he's kept, you know, his team motivated to achieve the things that they've achieved. He's gotten uh, the right recruits. He's gotten the right guys out of the transfer portal. I mean, look at his two guards. I mean, one of them is the kid who was at Rutgers last year, and before that wasn't he at, like, Loyola, Maryland, or some some small school before Rutgers got him. And the other guy's a transfer from East Carolina. He's, he's found a couple of guys that were – undervalued early in their college career and brought him to UConn and, and won big with him. So, you know, it props to him and he's a maniac on the sidelines. What are you expecting uh, this weekend in these games? The re restart uh, on Thursday. Uh, we'll start with Purdue. Well, we'll, we'll save that for the next segment, but um, Indiana state last night uh, gets a win. They move forward in the NIT going on to the final four. So congratulations to them. Yeah, they're in great shape. I mean, they've sold out home and center, what, all three games in the NIT. Now they go to Hinkle on Tuesday. I'm sure they'll have, what, 70 to 80 percent of the fans there. It'll be a, it'll be a huge Indiana State turnout. Um, and, you know, they've they pretty much made their case that the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee mistake by not including them in the field. They should have been one of the teams in the field. They were good enough to be one of the teams in the field, and uh, they got a bad deal. So good, good for them. Absolutely. We've got to take a break. The Captain Rick Bozich from WDRB.com is with us now. Back with more talking NCAA tournament right after this. We'll be right back for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. In the market. Yeah, baby. What else is new? Man. I'm just trying not to think about stuff for a minute. It hasn't stopped. <clears throat> are they supposed to, to get? The, are they supposed to get any of these guys, Connor Hickman, or any of these dudes? Man, until it's done, I am not. I've not seen anything. There's an official visit going on right now with Bryson Tucker, but he's different from he's a a 24 McDonald's All American wing. Uh, that would fill the Liam McNeely void. Uh, but that's Where not he come from. Is he, is he a prep school guy? Uh, you know what? I've not even gone uh, through all Bryson, that. Bryson Tiller. I think he's overtime elite or Tiller. He's a Tiller. Tiller. Okay, that's a, that's yeah. a singer too. He's uh, a, a guy from Louisville actually, believe it or not. Bryson <laughs> Tiller, <laughs> RB singer. <laughs> uh, what's his name? He, I think he's a reclassified guy. Bryson Tucker. Tucker. Okay, yeah, not Tiller. There is a Bryson Tiller, though. I had it right. Player. I'm sorry. Connor Hickman. Thinking, you might have been thinking of the singer, Rick. I was. <laughs> Bryson Tucker oh. is going to visit IU. I mean, uh, Connor Hickman is. Wasn't he? He probably had to play with Leal, didn't he? How old is uh, Hickman? He'll be a senior, so he's one year behind Leal. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Together. 40% three-point shooter. That'll give uh, – now, how amazing would that be to have two guys off of the same damn high school? Right. But they can't how, take – When's the last time Perkins. that happened? They can't take him and Perkins because, I mean, one of the guys they, – they have to take a point guard. They can't – you can't bring back – They've got a lot of open spots. But one of them's got to be a point guard. Oh, yeah, a, absolutely. A real point guard. Is Perkins There's, not uh, a point guard? I thought he was a point guard. Mm, he's not a pure point guard, I don't think. I don't know. What are you doing this weekend? Uh, I don't know. I haven't thought that far ahead. I'm still waiting for this coach to be named. It's been going Are you on. surprised about Calipari being retained or no? Oh, I didn't yeah, ever I think there up. was any chance uh, they were going to get rid of him. Exactly. No. It'll be interesting, the apathy. Not 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 apathy, but like how quickly it takes Kentucky fans to get frustrated next year if it doesn't work out. I mean, I don't – There's a second. He wins the offseason every year, so. They, yeah, they won't get excited until they do something in the tournament. I mean, they, they were excited about this team, and then Here they lost guys. in the tournament. Sorry. Fish house. No matter where you live. This segment is brought to you by the Ugly Grouper. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by 
Andy Morhada of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Wednesday as we're getting ready for the restarting of the NCAA tournament. Men's action tomorrow. Uh, Purdue, as we've said, will be taking on uh, Gonzaga this weekend. That's a great matchup, Rick. Uh, I've mentioned multiple times that when uh, Gonzaga played for the national championship a few years ago, Mark Few said afterwards that he had wished he had been able to play Baylor earlier in the year to get a sense of their physicality. And fortunately, Gonzaga did play Purdue early this year, so they have a sense of what it's like to play against a giant in uh, Zach Eady, and it gives them the opportunity to try to formulate a game plan against Purdue, which uh, it's not that Purdue is unbeatable. They're not. Uh, Zach Eady is almost impossible to stop, but you just have to figure out other ways of doing things. Uh, with with that team, and Mark Few is is a coach that can do that. So I think this is going to be a, a, a from here on out. It we're not going to see those Washington General blowouts like we saw in the first weekend. <laughs> no, I mean Gonzaga is really an interesting team in that I think they lost more games than they usually lose early in the year, and people kind of wrote them off and said this is going to be the year that Mark Few kind of falls off the cliff and then they fell but they lost their first game against St. Mary's and they didn't even win their conference and I'm pretty sure they lost in the conference tournament championship game too to St. Mary's uh but they did have some good wins I know they, their big win that got them back on board was they came to Lexington and beat UK and Rupp um Purdue's better Purdue, Purdue's already beat them once I think by double figures wasn't it so Purdue should win the game but Fuse a good coach and Gonzaga has that tournament pedigree so um, they're they're they should play loose and easy. Nobody expects them to be there. And at some point, I think the pressure kicks in for Purdue of uh, you know, you, you got to win or this season's not successful. That's one of the things I said about uh, Gonzaga earlier is usually they had been in that position where they were being talked about, where that pressure Correct. was there, where they are the expectations. Right. And this year they're under the radar. Absolutely. Uh, they've been under the radar all year, although like I said, they've, they're all the way up to 12 in Ken Palm. So they're, they're not bad. There's, they're really good on offense. They're seventh in offensive efficiency. They're just not as good as they used to be on defense. And I'm looking back at the first game when they played, it was the third game of the year. So the teams are very different now. Uh, but Edie did destroy him. He had 25 points, 14 rebounds and three blocks. So matching up hit with him, uh, Gonzaga's big men, you guys will remember uh, from two years ago when Indiana played Wyoming in the NCAA tournament, Graham Ike. Icky, but how, I don't know how you pronounce it. The kid from Wyoming, he's now Gonzaga's big man, and he's not nearly big enough to handle um, Edie. So they're going to have to come up with some kind of junk defenses or trick defenses. But they're they got two really good guards, and Nolan Hickman, who initially committed to Kentucky at one point, and Ryan Nembard, who started last year on that really good Creighton team. So uh, I'll, I'll definitely be watching that game. It's in it's in Detroit, right? Yes, sir. I mean, I was wrong. Right. I thought. I thought in the second game Purdue had to play. Uh, I think I said Tennessee or or Marquette. I think it's either Marquette or Creighton, right? Isn't Creighton yes. in the bracket? Because I have Creighton. I think, it's Creighton. I think it's Creighton. Isn't it Creighton? No. Yeah, it's Mar Marquette and Creighton. I'm pretty sure it is. No. Yeah. They Marquette and Tennessee. Hold on. Let me get. Let's I get. I don't have my my uh, bracket pulled up. Creighton faces number two Tennessee. Okay, so they either play Tennessee or Creighton. They've already beaten Tennessee. They haven't played Creighton. Either one of those teams is really good. Creighton's in my final four. They're in mine too. Ooh, I feel good already. <laughs> makes me feel better, baby. Who do you have um, in your final four? I've got Connecticut, Houston, Arizona, and Creighton. I have Connecticut. I have uh I had Kentucky, Creighton, and I'll be honest with you, I'm drawing a blank on uh who my Arizona or North Carolina. It might have been North Carolina. It was definitely not chalk. Uh, if I can get my bracket pulled Carolina's up. Carolina's chalk. <clears throat> I would not have gone chalk. Okay. I'm not a uh, – although I wished I would have. Um, boy, and if you pick the women's bracket, that's all you had to do, and you're in. You're in big time. Yeah, there's that's not as good. many – upsets in the women's tournament that the, the really good teams are stacked. They don't rarely get, Oh, Ohio state got knocked off, but other than them, that's it. 
Uh, oh, Baylor. I had Baylor, and it was my other team. Dag yeah, they, they lost second round, right? Yeah, it was not good. Uh, John Calipari, not a surprise at all to me that uh, he's coming back. I, I have said over and over, he's not going anywhere, people. You're not going to fire John Calipari this year. And at best for Kentucky fans, after next year, you work something out if it if things are still not going well. But, uh, yeah, that was not going to happen. Uh, they can get upset all they want, but uh, I, I, you, you can't carry the power that he has carried and then all of a sudden lose it completely unless you go out and, and pull a Bob Huggins, uh, which, uh, of course, in he has – is he's up he's his hat his hats in the ring for the louisville job uh if they get too desperate but louisville's had enough problems without adding to that but uh no surprise on calipari uh, i never thought there was any chance that john calipari wouldn't be back i've read some of the stories where people uh theorized that kentucky could and did raise the 32 or 33 million whatever it would be to buy him out but that wasn't going to happen and you know even if they did who are they going to get is any better um, at this point? I, I'm not sure. They talk about Jay Wright's not going to Kentucky. Um, somebody mentioned Brad Stevens. He's not going to Kentucky. Then the, the name you normally hear then is Scott Drew, a Baylor, because of his relationship with Mitch Barnhart. I'm not sure he leaves Baylor to go to Kentucky. So, you know, you're scrambling to find somebody – whose credentials aren't as good as Calipari's. The best thing to do is let him stay there and make him make, make him make some substantive changes, maybe in his assistant coaching staff or whatever, and uh, help him get the right guys out of the portal and see what he can do next year. I think he's embarrassed by what's happened and he's got enough pride that he'll find a way to, to make it better. You know, the only thing in regards to uh, the Louisville job that we have not seen uh, is, Oh man. Uh, Billy Donovan's wife was in town looking at houses. <laughs> Billy Donovan's name was on one of our early uh, hot boards. We, you yeah, had to I, there. I saw him trending one day, and I just started laughing. I'm like going, oh, Billy Donovan's wife must be in town looking at houses. You know, Billy Donovan got out of the game whenever he did because he was tired of recruiting. Now that you throw NIL and the transfer portal in there, it's even more recruiting because you got to recruit your own guys pretty much every day. That I, I I don't think he's ever going to be back in college basketball. Why would he be? It's it's just uh, how much longer does somebody like Tom Izzo stay in it because of this very reason? You know my my sense on uh, Tom Izzo was he wants to do it one more time. He's frustrated because they haven't. He won that national championship in. 2000 and he's never won another and now it's been a while since they've gotten back to the final four and i think he he's looks like the kind of guy who wants to go out more on top so at least with a final four appearance yeah and that's getting harder and harder to do just period much less to do it the way tom Izzo has done it um i i think that he ha is going to have to fill in and use the transfer portal some to get elite uh, again, and, and that's, it's, it's easy for me to say, I'm not in that position. He knows what he's doing. I would never question him, but, uh, it's, it's, there has, de there's been a corner turned and is he turning that corner or did he miss the turn? I mean, he had three really good freshmen on his team this year. Now, one of them got injured, so he couldn't play fears at the end, but I mean, Booker was a McDonald's all American, a top 10 player in the country. And he had very little impact on that team. And then there was the other guy, I think his name was Cohen who Indiana recruited, real kind of athletic, small forward type dude, and he wasn't a big impact player. I mean, Izzo's never been a guy who's really relied on freshmen. He's a he's a culture guy. He's a he's a development guy. So that's that's going to be a, a a needle for him to thread in in this era where guys really don't want to wait their turn anymore. They want to play and play pretty quickly. Um, what? So I'm not getting in trouble again with the Purdue fans. Um. <laughs> Someone says, name another seven-footer who can play Edie's minutes. Well, what does that have to do with anything? Um, I, hey, I'm not saying I've got the recipe, but they're not unbeaten. Uh, I, I think teams with really, really good guards and shooters is what it will take to beat Purdue and good defense on them. 
And because you're not going to stop Edie, he's going to get his. And I'm not saying that they're going to get beat. I, but I just, I don't have them picked in my final four for that reason. You know, I mean, people have beaten them this year. People have beaten them in, in previous tournaments. Um, so much is dependent, I think, on how the game is called. I've never, it's been a while since I've seen a player who's so divisive. Everybody who plays against Purdue swears that Zach Eady gets the breaks and gets the calls. And Purdue people thinks that Zach Eady takes more abuse than any big man should take. Uh, so it's going to depend on how the game is called and whether he can stay out of foul trouble. Um, and I think the way to beat Purdue is you, you beat them with really strong guard play because um, I think you can attack their guards off the dribble. Uh, I've seen it happen before. And obviously, you know, as we've seen in, in almost every tournament upset, um, if you make threes, you got a chance to beat them. So can, fuse. this is a big game because this is the game plan game. It's the game where you have preparation time plan. It's not the one day turnaround game. Uh, few has had a chance. He's already played Purdue once. He's got a chance to game plan. I'm sure he'll, you'll be able to tell early in the game what they, what they're going to try and do with Edie. It's a matter of whether that's actually a, a strategy that will work. And getting it done is a whole nother thing as well. Correct. Um, it, I, but here's something I discovered kind of accidentally when I was researching an answer to somebody, someone had sent me a question or said something. And I, so I started to do some research and what I found out was the last five national champions. And I stopped there cause I didn't have any more time, but the last five national champions have had a minimum of four NBA draft picks on their roster. They did not have to be draft picks that year. They could have been the following year, but they were on the roster and on the team. Purdue has won right now, to my best uh, best guess. And so there's a reason why I don't see Purdue winning the national championship. When you have three or four NBA pl uh, ca caliber players, then that means your guys have to keep up with NBA caliber talent. Uh, across the board in, 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 in certain positions. So that's what makes it difficult. That's why I don't, that's a big reason why I don't have Purdue winning the national championship. Yeah. I mean, are they one of the teams that can win it? Yeah. If I, if I had to evaluate them all, I'd, I'd say they're probably the second most likely. I think Connecticut is the most likely, uh, but it's, it's a hard thing to do because it's got to win four games against at this point, really strong quality, competition um so the odds are against everybody really i mean there's not anybody out there that's probably better than what maybe a you kind of might be maybe what a 30 percent chance to win it all uh against the rest of the field um purdue would probably be the second choice if i had to guess i haven't looked at the las vegas odds uh just a matter of staying healthy staying out of foul trouble and you know playing your best. You never know when a guy on your team could pop up with a the flu or food poisoning or a tender ankle that he sprains in practice. I mean, everything's got to go your way. Well, here's a stat for you from uh, covers on t Twitter. In the Sweet 16, Matt Painter is one and five. Yeah. He did wow. not have Zach Eady on any of those teams. Right. Is that the year they – I forgot who they beat in Louisville and then they played Virginia the next game? Uh, with uh, Carson Edwards. Yeah, Carson Edwards played a, a phenomenal game. Yeah. It might have been um, like 2018, if I had yeah, to guess. Uh, I 19, I think? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Back around there, uh, absolutely. But in addition to the players better, the coaching is better. So now you're going against better right. coaches as well. So everything yeah. – Everything heats up. You're, it was 2019. You're right. And to show you how thin the margin is between glory and, you know, heartache, they beat Tennessee in overtime and then they lost to Virginia in overtime. In the Virginia game, they could have easily won because that's the game where was a missed free throw or something happened and uh, Kihei Clark picked up the ball for Virginia and threw it to Diakate and he threw up a shot at the buzzer and tied it and they won it in overtime by five. And is that the isn't that the year that Virginia won their national title? Yes, it is. Kyle Guy and uh, Ty Jerome and what was the other guy's name? Hunter DeAndre Hunter. Kyle Guy, huh? Where was he from? That's one of the all-time worst 
moments for With- Tom Crane's recruiting. Oh boy. Yeah. It's been going on for a minute. But, uh, <laughs> it's been going on for a minute. You know, uh, that's, that's the story that we'll be talking about a lot in the summer and into the fall. You got Sisley, you got Mullins, you got Harrelson and you got Robinson. You got four top 100 players in the state of Indiana and where they go to school is going to have a huge impact on what Indiana fans are going to think about the direction of the IU program. Agree or disagree? Absolutely. A thousand percent agree. And does the recruiting that's going on right now, what they do, how much impact is going, is is that going to have on what you just said? Uh, A lot. I think it'll have a lot, Um, you know, but they, they need to get, they need to get at least two of those guys, in my opinion. You, they need to get at least two of those guys. And I don't think they're going to have the entire season next year to show that they're playing better, that they have a better team, that they have a better offense oh, no. bef- before these guys make decisions. No, I mean, some, some of those guys commit during the summertime, and then they usually commit in November before the season even begins. So you're going to have to get out and do the work before then. You're going to have to do it once the – college basketball season is over the AAU season heats up and you're going to have to be uh, aggressive and persistent in terms of communicating to these, these guys that uh, you're part of the plan moving forward, because I know that Notre Dame wants them. And I know that Purdue wants them. And I know that Michigan state wants them. And I'm going to guess pretty strongly that Mr. Dusty may will be on all those guys to try and get them to Ann Arbor. Yeah, that's, I think that's, he's going to be too little too late for, for those guys, but I think that's another thing. I'm glad, glad you brought that up. I talked about now you've got another real player in recruiting the state of Indiana, uh, as solid as the teams that are in Indiana. Uh, I, I think that the Dusty is going to be able to do, recruit as well as Purdue and Indiana can recruit in this state. Indiana has chosen kind of not to, uh, if they're getting back to it. Uh, but it's going to be if Indiana does not land Sisley and or, and say Mullins, there's going to be just the na- the wailing and gnashing of teeth will continue. Oh yeah, I mean loud and furiously because of the fact that um, they know that Sisley's brother is a student at IU right now. I think and his sister is too. Yep. Uh, and they know that he lives what an hour, hour and fifteen minutes away from campus. South, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I pretty. I think I've heard that Mullins has some IU connections too, uh, and I think Harrelson has a family member who went to IU. I mean, these guys already have some connections to IU, so they need they they need to get these guys. They really do. I mean, I, I've been, I, I've talked about this before, but I I compare it back to the the last year when when Crean was there when. It was uh, what was the kid from the kid that went to Michigan State who's now in the NBA, the big kid. There was Malik Williams who went to Louisville. There was Paul Scruggs who went to Xavier. Was and it Miles was, Bridges? No, the big guy. He's on the Memphis Grizzlies. Jalen Jackson. Okay. Um, and then the other, the fourth one was um, the kid Chris Wilkes uh, who went to UCLA. They Jamal's were all top brother. 100 players, and Indiana didn't get any of them. And uh, it it, it it sent a lot of anguish through. But they got Grant Galan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who who did they get. That was the class when they got maybe Clifton Moore and Justin Smith and uh, Al Durham. Maybe I don't. Justin remember. Smith ended you. up being amazing at Arkansas yeah. after he left Indiana. He was, and Chris Wilkes right. really didn't do that much at UCLA. Scruggs had a good career at Xavier. Uh, Malik Williams didn't really he was hurt at louisville and jalen jackson was really good and he is still in the nba so that was the big miss uh what are you looking forward to this weekend looking forward to a coach at louisville so i can not have to look at my phone every 17 seconds to see what somebody's tweeted or said that's hey do they still have all the chairs set up at the yub center (laughs) waiting no they took them down i think they (laughs) took them down not not long after my tweet (laughs) that's freaking hilarious 
and I appreciate the, uh, and I have to say, I appreciate the, uh, the activism of getting out and getting that picture, man. Or did someone take that and send it to you? No, I took it myself. The only mistake I made was I had Ruby with me. I left her in the car. I should have taken her up by the door so people could see <laughs> Ruby and the chairs. <laughs> hunting, hunting. Where's, what was that commercial where's back the in coach? the days? Where's, where's Dusty uh, May, Ruby? Where's, uh, what was that? There was a politician that uh, way, way One back. And Mitch McConnell was hunting for D. Huddleston when he. Yeah, went. where's D? Where's D? Oh my gosh, that's funny. Now we're really showing our age because that was 117 years ago. I know it, man. I can't help it. That's uh, funny stuff. Rick Bozitz from WDRB.com. Make sure you're giving him a follow. He is the captain of uh, college basketball coverage. Appreciate you, my friend. All right. Thank you, Jim. Have a good weekend. Absolutely. Hey, we've got more coming up this week uh, on Friday. Kyle Macy will join us. We'll talk more NCAA basketball. He works for Westwood One Radio Network. And, of course, uh, from Peru, Indiana, won a national championship at Kentucky way back in 1978. So uh, looking forward to talking to him about all things that are going on in uh, the tournament, et cetera. And uh, the NCAA tournament gets underway tomorrow We'll be back tomorrow to talk, uh, to prepare for that, but also talking some football. Shannon Griffith to join us uh, and uh, plenty more. Man, it's been a great fun day today. As always, Dylan Sin from the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette, Kyle Nedrip from the Indy Star, and of course, Rick Bozich from WDRB.com just joined us there as well. Most importantly, uh, thanks to uh, John, the producer, and you guys. Without you, we have no reason to be here and are greatly and sincerely appreciative to you. We're back tomorrow to do it again. Until then, I'm Jim Coyle. I will see you on the radio. Thanks for listening to Indiana Sports Beat Radio. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page for more clips and team coverage of Indiana basketball, football, and more. You can also find full episodes and tons of other content on thehoosier.com. We'll see you next time for another edition of Indiana's